Hello, guys. Um, Jen owes me huge for this, by the way. Um, as she said, I do have uh, the opportunity to work all over the world. Um, and Jen, when I signed up to do this with Jen, I was like, oh, sure, no problem. I'll come and talk for you know, 45 minutes, which I do on a pretty regular basis, no problem. Uh, but uh, then she threw in, I had to do a PowerPoint. So that threw me for a whole loop. So then I actually was given an assignment, um, something that I hadn't been given in a long time. So. Um, so thanks, Jen. Um, and also, I did just get done teaching a seven-day course uh, with a group of shadow students, uh, obviously one from Belize, a couple from Florida. Um, I also had one from Singapore that had come to train with us. Um, so yeah, I keep definitely busy that way. Um, and I guess Jen pretty much kind of wrapped it all up what I do. But, uh, but yeah, basically, I guess a lot of people ask, you know, I know back in the day when I was in college, and seriously, if you didn't hear me before, I really do still have nightmares about being late for classes. Um, I'm not kidding. So this was kind of like revisiting my college days. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So these are basically my main roles. Um, dog trainer, that's what a lot of people see me as. Um, and I have worked in every capacity with dogs over the last 20 years. I know I look young, <laughs> um, but it's always been pretty much my love and my passion. But I've worked in every capacity from kennel tech to animal control officer. Um, so I have scoop poop, I mop, um, I do just about anything I could um, just to be able to kind of follow my passion of working with dogs um, and being able to actually succeed at it because um, we'll talk a little bit about that because <laughs> sometimes I wasn't always so successful. Um, I've also trained over 60 dogs for a movie. Um, Alicia here helped me with that one. Um, I definitely won't do that again. But you know what? It looks really good on my resume. <laughs> so we're going to keep that. But uh, yeah, movies and dogs. Uh, they say don't work with kids and dogs. And we worked in a movie which had lots of both. So um, the director and the assistant director were always uh, a little bit stressed out with us. And you know, dogs don't work under those capacities. So, um, so yeah, I worked, uh, worked through that. Um, but my passion for dogs has also taken me um, to work and live in Belize. Um, through that, uh, working with Kathy, she was out here working with me, she usually comes about once a year. Um, but through that, I actually um, was featured on an episode of House Hunters International. Anybody watch that show? Nobody? Man, I love that show. Yeah, it's called Pet Peeves in Belize. I loved it before I ever asked, uh, was asked to go onto the show. Um, but yeah, I did an episode. If you get to catch it, please check it out. Every time after the episode airs, I get about 1,500 Facebook requests um, because I have a condo in Belize and everyone wants to go and stay there. So everyone is contacting me. I want to go volunteer at the shelter and I want to stay at your condo. So um, it works out pretty well. Um, but yeah, my work with dogs has pretty much allowed me to travel pretty much all over the world. Um, I did just get back from 10 days working in Taiwan. Um, we had a blast um, working there. Um, and then I also got suckered into bringing home a two-legged dog. <laughs> so Odin is not my only disabled dog. Um, I have a real propensity to adopt old dogs, uh, disabled dogs, blind dogs, um, because they're not really a lot of work. <laughs> Don't let the two-legged dog fool you, though. He is very fast. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I brought him home. Um, he's now a part of my family. Um, he is... Uh, doing fine, fitting in really well. But yeah, you'd be surprised at how easy it is to bring a dog home from Taiwan. Uh, let me know if you guys want any, <laughs> okay? Keep me posted, I can make that happen for you. Um, also, last April, I was asked to uh, teach at an education at sea. Um, basically, we got to drink and cruise around the Caribbean uh, talking about dogs. It was awesome. <laughs> it was really cool. Um, and I say, you know, hey, not bad for a dog trainer, right? You know, my dog, my parents basically still think um, that this is a hobby, right? So even, I think they kind of got past that once I was approached by Cesar Milan to work with him. Um, but they do kind of still perceive what I do, you know, they're like, oh, when are you gonna get a real job? And I'm like, mom, I made $100,000 last month, <laughs> you know? So, um, but it, it's hard for people to understand sometimes. Um, but so currently, um, I run a large training center in Draper. Um, that is definitely my location and where I love to be. Um, even when I'm not traveling, I try and spend time there. Um, I have about 20 staff there with me currently, I think. That is that who we have working? Okay. I have about 20 staff there. I don't know. It kind of fluctuates. There's people I walk in. I don't even know who they are. I'm like, hey, I guess you work here now. <laughs> um, so, bye, Odin. See you later. Don't fall off the stage. <laughs> hey. 
He's like, oh, sorry. This is why I hate bringing him, man. This guy just steals the show all the time. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I literally have been sought out by some of the best in the business. Um, how I got to know Cesar Milan, um, he was here three years ago um, for a show that he was putting on, a live show. I think it was at Abravano Hall, if I remember correctly. Ironically enough, I didn't even have tickets to the show, um, but he had contacted me and asked me about coming to visit my training center because he had heard about what I was doing. Um, one of the things that I do is I run these very large socials for difficult and aggressive dogs um, every Saturday, and I've been doing that for about eight years. So he came to my training center. Um, <laughs> well, first I'll tell you what happened when I picked him up. Does anyone know Caesar? Raise your hand if you've heard of Caesar Milan. Okay, good, everybody. Do you know his dog, Junior? So there's this great pet named Junior. And so I go to pick him up and I just got in this new truck. And so I'm shaking completely because I'm like, oh my God, I'm hanging out with Caesar Milan, ah! you know? And I, it wasn't that I, you know, had really like followed everything that he had did, but of course I knew who he was. He's a celebrity to me in my existence and my world. So he ended up um, putting Junior in the back. And when he got into the back of the truck, his elbow hit the dog gate in the back and it like crushed Junior. <laughs> so, so he basically, you know, kind of, I'm like, oh man, I'm so embarrassed. Like my face turned beet red and I, you know, just apologized. And, and he was, no, 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 it's no problem. He was super humble. And so what he did is he actually held the dog gate up so that it wouldn't be laying on Junior for the rest of the car ride. Oh, he's gonna fall, he's gonna fall, catch him. Just kidding. He usually doesn't fall far. And actually for a step like that, he would probably leap into Alessandro's lap here. Um, so basically, um, I got to spend the day with Caesar, um, even after that first initial embarrassment. But spent the day with him. We talked about dogs, um, but we mostly talked about food and gardening. <laughs> if you ever want to talk to Caesar Milan about anything, that's what he wants to talk about. Don't ask him questions about dogs. So um, yeah, but then about a month later, he asked me to come out to his facility, the Dog Psychology Center out in California, um, for a shadow pro or to shadow him, basically. Um, for a workshop that they were going to be starting. Um, so I was immediately hired on after that, and I've had the opportunity to teach workshops with him um, pretty much ever since then, um, and it's been great. I really enjoyed it, but that's just a small part of what I do. Um, but it, uh, it has been a, a big opportunity for me to be able to reach out to students from around the world, um, which has been really great. Um, my other role, um, serial entrepreneur. I can barely spell that or say it. Um, but apparently that's what people call me. Have you guys talked about that in these so-called business classes you're taking? Okay, good. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, and as a serial entrepreneur, um, I'm never resting, okay? I'm always experimenting. So even where I'm at in my world and in my career, and I'll kind of keep talking about where I'm at, where I've failed, where I've struggled, um, I'm always experimenting and keep trying what I'm doing. So that's kind of the definition of a serial entrepreneur. And I definitely identify with that, okay? Definitely identify with that. Um, I will definitely talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly of that more later. Um, my biggest personal role is being a mom. Um, I have a daughter who's about a year old. Wow, talk about awesome. <laughs> that's very cool. Um, I definitely enjoy that. Um, oh, and also, I do have a college degree. <laughs> um, I did graduate in 2002 from Westminster. Um, that actually has little to do with probably why I'm standing here, but it was from my parents and they're totally happy that I graduated from college. So um, we'll let them you know, be happy with that part. But, uh, but yeah, it was more my passion that led me into doing what I'm doing. So don't, don't drop out of college, you guys, still do that, <laughs> okay? Um, so the fun part is actually trying to balance all of these roles that I play. Um, there's a lot more of them that I play, but these are definitely the biggest ones that I identify with and most people would recognize from me. Um, so I'm guessing I've been asked to come and speak because uh, Jen thinks I'm successful. Um, but uh, but I, I feel that I'm successful not just in my business life, but definitely in my personal life. Um, and I'll talk about kind of how I, how I balance those things out. Um, so let's take a look at the overview so you guys can have a little idea. Um, and basically every PowerPoint presentation has to have bullet points. So I went ahead and did that for you guys because I didn't want to disappoint. Okay, it was either that or flow charts and I couldn't figure out any way to like put this into a flow chart, so I went with bullet points. Um, so what is success? That's something probably we should talk about before we ever can figure it out. So um, we're gonna kind of go through a definition with that. Um, reasons for starting a business? It's probably a good question. Seems like a lot of people wanna do it, right? Motivations for success? 
got to be motivated to do much of anything, right? Without motivation, you're probably going to really not be successful. Uh, reasons for failure. There's definitely a lot of reasons for failure. Um, many, many, many businesses do not last. Um, I did own one of those. I am part of a statistic. Um, lessons learned, basically my awesome failures. Um, and then <laughs> my keys to success. Um, so first and foremost, what is success? What would you guys call success? Can you yell it out? I'll repeat it for the mic. Doing what you love, I think. Doing what you love, OK. Yeah. Anyone else? What's success? Perspective or respect? Yes, respected for what you do. Yeah. Progress. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, these are all things. So, <laughs> success. I do love these. Like, of course, I got to go over, you know, all over uh, Google and check all these things out. So, I mean, some people dream of success while there's wake up and work. Yeah, that's kind of true. You know, I wish my job ended at five. <laughs> that would be a dream come true. Doesn't quite happen. So, I kind of came up with some different things that I was thinking of when I was thinking of what is success, just like I asked you guys. So success, some of the ones that I came up with that crossed my mind, financial security, right? Somebody with financial security you would consider successful. Uh, wealth accumulation, personal freedom, public recognition, sense of accomplishment. That's kind of what I always fell into, and creative outlet. So success is different for everyone. Um, you can probably imagine that a musician's, um, you know, kind of definition of success would probably vary greatly from my definition of success. Right, Jen? <laughs> yeah. So, um, but from my experience, I've never known anybody that has had real success um, without passion. Okay. When you have passion, the money will come. So it's always good to have something that you're very passionate about before you ever think about this. Um, Often success is associated with owning a business, right? So well, let's look at these for one second, though. Um, if I'm looking at these, which one of these are actually more associated with passion? Personal yeah, personal freedom. Probably some of the lower ones, right? So personal freedom, public recognition, sense of accomplishment. Definitely these two, for sure, a creative outlet. So this might not have anything to do with financial, but it definitely has something to do with feeling successful or being successful for this per particular individual. Um, this kind of stuff, if this is kind of your, your motivation, sometimes this isn't going to last real long. So, but these ones, I think, have a little tendency to, to stick a little, bit, uh, a little bit longer. So why would someone want to start a business? Give me some options. Why would somebody want to start a business? Yeah, right? Ding, ding, ding. Yeah, I'm just going to go to the next slide because, hello. <laughs> I want to be my own boss, right? Yeah, that's typically what everyone says. And I'll tell you, the fun thing about being your own boss is often you don't get paid. You don't get a regular paycheck. Um, you're working 24-7. Um, but it sounds so good at first, <laughs> right? I want to be my own boss. Um, other people get rich, right? Financial security, status recognition. Um, in the students that I had uh, working with me this last week, um, I had a woman from Florida that just started her own business. And the first thing she did is she handed me her business card. Right? What do you think the title said on it? Yeah, owner, president. Right? So status recognition. So now she had a new business that she had literally just started, but now she was so excited to be able to say, you know what, I'm a business owner. Because doesn't that sound good, though? When I tell people, even back in the day when I was struggling and eating ramen when I could afford it, um, <laughs> you know, I still had the opportunity to tell people I was a business owner. And that still felt good. And for some reason, that gave me status already, right? Just saying that even though, you guys, I was thousands of dollars in the holes at certain points in my career. So it's kind of part of that, right? Um, so there's definitely a lot of reasons to want to start a business. Um, but truly being successful has little to do with financial motivations. But that's sometimes always why we might want to get started. Um, definitely financial security was what, uh, what helped me on that path. Um, has anyone heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Yeah. Okay, do you guys talk about this in this class? Okay, but you've heard about it, yeah. So, um, so basically it's a theory in psychology by Abraham Maslow from his 1943 paper 
um, titled A Theory of Human Motivation. So let's take a look at these motivations um, as it relates to business. I don't know if you guys can actually read this, but I'll kind of step up for here so you can see it. Um, so when I first started, and no, Wi-Fi is not a basic need. I actually looked this up and like the bottom was actually drawn in with Wi-Fi <laughs> right along here. So if you can't read it. Um, so basically when I first started, well, let's talk about where I am now. Where I am now, I'm basically working and living in this realm um, that I am self-actualization, -actual achieving one's full potential, including creative activities. So I actually have time to do all the other things because I don't have to worry about food and water and warmth anymore. But this is where I started, right? This was my original motivation to wanting to be my own business person, okay? So as I got better and better, trust me, I spent a lot of time in this realm down here, just in the basic needs, uh, but I did start to be able to start moving up into this realm, um, prestige and a feeling of accomplishment, okay? But now I kind of get to mess around with all sorts of stuff. Um, I actually have steers. I have a Texas Longhorn that I'm training for riding. Who does that? <laughs> right? Somebody who lives in this world gets to do that, right? So I just, you know, kind of thought it'd be kind of fun. I thought dogs had gotten easy, so of course I needed a 1,200-pound uh, horned beast um, to work with. So, um, so as you guys can see, you know, you may start down here. This is usually the beginnings, okay? But it's always going to be a nice progression, and I hope that everybody at some point gets to, uh, you know, maybe not by steer, but you can pretty much uh, get the concept. Um, so, so everyone goes into, into business with good motivation. So why do so many fail? Okay, let's take a look at some stats. Yeah, that's right, stats. I said stats. That was my least favorite class in college, by the way. Yeah, if you haven't taken it, good luck. Hated it. <laughs> um, so sorry, these are a little bit fuzzy. This is what happens when you just peel them off of Google. Um, but this small business survival rate, look at this. This is not good, you guys. Seven out of 10 new employers, or no, new employer firms. So actually as a small business, um, do you guys know what actually qualifies as a small business? Yeah, less than 500. The majority though, well I, I don't know that I could say the majority, most of them are still under 20 employees. And most of them beyond that are actually non-employees, so they don't have employees, it's one man band, okay? So this is actually referring to the new employer firms, okay? The companies that are actually hiring employees. But seven out of 10 in the first two years, okay? In my first business, it did not last five years. And I struggled in the first two. So it was, it was surprising, it lasted about four years, but that was, it wasn't gonna last much past that, but that was because of the next slides that I'm gonna show you guys. Um, so as you can see, this is pretty detrimental. Um, I'm proud to say that I am actually at 15 years in my current business form. So that is very awesome. And it's only gotten better every year. Um, you know, when I used to have these goals of you know, making certain amounts in a month, you know, say, okay, I really hope that this month we're gonna break 3,000. You know, now I laugh at those numbers, <laughs> right? But it's gotten better and better and better. But as you can see for everyone, it just doesn't stay that way, okay? Yeah, these are my stats, guys. Check it out. <laughs> um, you know, and not only is my business surviving, it's thriving, all right? And I actually had my business open through, you know, 2008 when everything went to crap and everyone else was basically crying about the economy, the economy, the economy, and I was crying a bit too, but you know, I never really kind of set myself up for failure. So, um, so why do so many fail? <laughs> dun, dun, dun. And these numbers don't add up, so I don't know how, uh, where the rest of them go, so there's like some random numbers out there. Um, but I do really like the very first one, uh, incompetence. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> that was definitely me in my first business and definitely kind of this, uh, you know, stuff that was going back and forth. Um, and incompetence basically includes, and I'll tell you, this is ridiculous for dog trainers. Um, as dog trainers, we walk into it because we love what we do so much. We're just so adamant about getting the information out to people. And plus, it kind of throws in this other element of when you're working with, a, you know, with an animal, with something that's a living, breathing creature, and your emotions are associated with it. But even when I looked this up, like these, these stats, um, incompetence, the first thing that came up under incompetence was emotional pricing. 
right? Or I would even say not even just emotional pricing, but also thinking about the concept that you're not worth what you should be charging. I see that all the time in dog trainers. My uh, consultation fee for my, um, my most affordable program is $350. That's what I charge, that's my base rate and goes all the way up to 2300 for some of my more advanced programs. Okay, yeah, that's for one dog. <laughs> right? Um, but I've gotten to a point where I'm very comfortable charging that. When I first started, I didn't know that I was worth that. So I think that's where a lot of businesses fail, where you want to just draw people in. Um, you know what I think looks very desperate in businesses? This is when you can tell a business is really failing. They're trying to offer too much, right? Discounts, discounts, discounts. I have never, ever, ever offered a discount. Not that I don't give a whole bunch of stuff away for free to shelters and rescues every once in a while. That's why I'm not allowed to answer the phone at my business. Um, but I, I also have the freedom to do that now from where I'm at. But, um, but yeah, it looks very desperate when you start getting to that point of 50% off, this and that. So, so emotional pricing is definitely one of those parts of incompetence. Um, also, living too high for the business. I made that mistake. You know, if you see money coming in, sometimes you're not going to be checking it going out the door, okay? Uh, Non-payment of taxes. I did that. Not that I meant to, but it was because of my incompetence. I didn't know how to. And there were taxes that I didn't even know existed, right? I wish in college, you guys, I honestly wish I would have majored in business. I think everybody should, or at least everyone should take definitely a business class because this is the stuff that in life, as many people as want to start business, this is the biggest failure because nobody takes classes and learns how to do it. I wish I would have taken a class. <laughs> Maybe I'll come sit in a couple times, <laughs> see what I can do. Um, uh, no knowledge of pricing, that's another problem with incompetence. Um, lack of planning. A lot of people start businesses with not even a, a business plan. You know, when I talk to trainers, when they come out, I say, well, do you have a business plan? What's that? You know, just go get a book. You know, go get a book, learn how to write a business plan. But also, I didn't do that either because I thought, I, I thought it was just too easy. Um, no experience in record keeping. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know much about that. QuickBooks is awesome, guys. Just saying. Um, unbalanced experience or lack of managerial experience. So that's another 30%. I don't know where the other percentages go. Um, but expansion too rapidly. Uh, I definitely see this a lot with dog trainers, and I will talk about how I also made that mistake. But a lot of dog trainers, they get into training, and all they want to do is open a facility, open a facility, open a facility. I'm telling you guys, when you go that step, your overhead gets huge, right? Your overhead gets huge. So they just aren't perceiving that. They think that if they build it, that people will start supporting them. But business is not always bricks and mortar, okay? It's not always bricks and mortar. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I am in the middle of opening two more locations. <laughs> and it's real scary for me because now I'm at that point where I can start looking back at my previous failures and go, oh man, I don't want to be struggling again, you know, but I know that as that serial entrepreneur, I really want to continue moving and growing and experimenting. I might not succeed in this, but I'm at least going to try, okay? I'm at least going to try. Um, these are the major ones, so let's talk about some of the um, management ones that could be a real problem. And I'll read these guys out for you guys because they're a little bit tiny, teeny tiny. Good job, Odin, holding down the podium. Okay, so um, going into business for the wrong reasons. Obvious, right? That would be a huge mistake. If you're not passionate about it, that's going to be a problem. Oh, lordy, if you can read this one, um, advice from family and friends. That's one of the worst mistakes you can make because, as I said with my family, they are not dog people. Um, they don't quite understand, you know, my passion and what I do. Um, excuse me. They don't understand that stuff, but um, they really wanted to give me a lot of advice um, when I was in business, especially when I was failing. Um, sometimes you might find somebody good in your family. Uh, my dad is uh, very good at business. Um, he helps me quite a bit, and he's always been kind of my shoulder to lean on. So if you do have somebody who's sane in your family, take advantage of that. Um, being in the wrong place at the wrong time, yeah. If you wanted to open a business in 2008, that probably would have been pretty tricky, okay. Um, entrepreneur gets worn out and or underestimates the time requirements. I get contacted constantly by dog trainers that have just opened a facility, and they can't believe that they're working 24 hours a day. Sorry, guys. Dogs do not stop pooping on the weekends. 
I swear, <laughs> okay? And we don't get weekends or holidays off either, um, especially in this business. You could probably pick a business, but really, you know, it's a lot of time constraints. Um, family pressure on time and money commitments. Yeah, that's a huge one. You know, somebody's working, 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 trying to make this work, and they're not spending time with their family. That's a huge one. Pride, that's definitely a big one. Um, lack of market awareness, just not being aware, obviously. Um, if you're overpriced or underpriced, you could really be doing yourself a lot of damage. Um, entrepreneur falls in love with the product business. Sometimes that really clouds your judgment, so you can't make rational choices when you're just being too emotional about the product, okay? Talk about dogs, that's a very emotional product right there, right? I know, you're more than a product, buddy. Um, lack of financial responsibility and awareness. Yes, I was definitely very, very, very guilty of that in my first business. I was young too, so I was, I was out drinking more often. So um, lack of clear focus. Everywhere, you know, you're trying to do too much, so it really creates a lot of confusion. This last one, I don't understand, too much money. Oh no, too much money. So I don't know exactly how that fits into this, but it was on here, so I have to put it up here. So um, optimistic, realistic, or pessimistic. So you can kind of be a little bit too much of any of those things, okay? Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> Lessons learned. Let's talk about how much I failed. <laughs> okay, okay, it's not a failure if you don't learn something. It's only failure if you don't learn something. Um, I really love this saying um, because no one succeeds without learning through mistakes, right? If you don't fail, you guys, if you are always just given everything, you're just not really gonna be successful. You always have to fall down a little bit to be able to come back up. Um, so let's just say my first business taught me a lot, <laughs> okay? Um, I bought a retail pet store that offered grooming. Um, this was in Cottonwood Heights, so this was in a very nice neighborhood. Um, and it had already been operating for about 20 years. So that's the, the gentleman I bought it from, had owned it for 20 years. Um, it was making about twelve to $15,000 a month. And the profit from looking over his, his very well manicured books, he knew what he was doing. <laughs> um, the profit was about $2,000 a month. And at my age, I was like, yes, $2,000 a month, it's so cool. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna have so much money and do so much stuff. So that all made sense to me. Um, but at the time, I just didn't really comprehend all of this. And so I bought this. Um, as soon as I took over, um, I changed everything and I didn't know anything. All right, I didn't know how to, all those things, yeah, I failed at all of those. I didn't know anything. So once the money started coming in, I didn't know how to keep track of it. I mean, I was keeping track of it technically, but I was spending it faster than it was, you know, than what was happening. So my margins were not very good. Um, and it's not that I wasn't trying. <laughs> I'll tell you guys, I hate bugs and I hate spiders, okay? This is my least favorite things ever. Um, and you guys ever seen uh, feeder crickets? You know, so you gotta like put them in a little bag. Yeah, I learned how to do that. To me, that was huge, <laughs> you know, that I did that all on my own. So um, I also learned how to groom because at that location, I started to realize that it was 100% profit to me. Why would I wanna pay somebody else a 60-40 split when I could just do a bath on a dog for 100% profit to me? Uh, the groomers weren't happy with me, so talk about poor managerial skills as well. So I kind of kept trying to do everything I could um, but basically what I did is I expanded too fast. I ended up moving into the space next door and this is a huge overhead cost. Um, the rent was very expensive because it is, it's right off of 6200 South and Highland. Um, but just a very nice area, but I expanded into the space next door and that's where I was going to run my rescue out of. So that's what I started with was running a rescue. Um, and so I had 16 kennels there and I pretty much Oh, yeah, it was real rough, you know. Basically, I was spending all this money on the rescue dogs, and I wasn't really focused on the retail and the grooming. Can you see which part I wasn't passionate about? Yeah, I basically bought a retail pet store with grooming, but I didn't care about either of those things. So what I was doing was trying to balance out the both of them through doing adoptions and rescue. Even months that I was doing, let's say, 75 adoptions, I was still in the hole. I was still losing money pretty much every month. If I broke even that month, I was happy, okay? So it was a really hard, you know, hard thing for me to do because I got to a point where I knew 
um, that it was failing. You know, I knew that it was failing. Um, over the three years that I ran it, I definitely learned a lot. Um, but yeah, I was failing and doing everything wrong. I was a horrible manager. I knew nothing about in inventory. Um, I didn't know how to balance books. I was learning, but you know, I was spending so much money on the rescue, I was always in the hole. I always spent money I didn't have. So I kept trying to spend money to make money, right? Try to spend money to bring it back in. So once, the, once I got there, I had to let it go, right? So I basically got my MBA in business through that experience. But what I did is I actually was fortunate enough to be able to sell it to my groomers. So the groomers that have been working there. So talk about a no fail win win, right? I was taking the rescue away from them and they were being able to be giving 100% profit to the money that was coming into a very, very functional and successful business. Do you think they survived? They didn't. They made more mistakes than I did. They made a lot more mistakes than I did, and they saw the same problems, and I saw the same problems as soon as I handed it back over to them. So they were doing the same thing. They made every change that they could um, with the pet store, with the retail. They made every possible mistake they could have. Within six months, they were closed. And that was very sad, because I was like, oh, you guys are going to be super successful at this. This is your passion. Um, but I think as far as their struggles, I think they just weren't meant to be business leaders. They weren't meant to be in that position. They did better getting a paycheck. And some people really do better just getting a paycheck. Um, so this was definitely trial by fire. Um, I was drowning and stressed, and my ego was being crushed every day. Um, eventually I realized it's just not going to work. Um, and that's when everything changed. Yay! So I didn't fail, I just learned something. So everything changed. I went out to California. I started working with a trainer out there. Um, my goals of rescue turned into wanting to do training. And so I basically kind of started a whole new path. Even though this had kind of, you know, really beat me down, I didn't let it be the end of me. You know, I didn't let it be the end of me. So I kept going, kept doing what I'm doing, ended up being to where I am now. Um, and I'm happy for that experience, even though at the time it seemed like I wasn't gonna get out of it. I'm very happy and grateful for the experience that I had um, in that endeavor. So now that we're done talking about the failures, <laughs> let's talk about basically my keys to success. Um, and this, I think you'll see across the board, this isn't just for me, you guys. I mean, this is anyone. I mean, if you look up anyone, you know, Bill Gates, um, anyone, this is going to be kind of the same thing. Um, passion and perseverance. That's huge. That's the main thing, I think, when it comes to being successful. Passion and perseverance, also known as grit, okay? The grit, the more grit you have, the more likely you are to be successful, okay? I had no fear of failure. Even though I had failed, I didn't fear it. You know, and even today, I'm taking more risks and chances, and I don't fear that I'm going to fail. All right? If I did, do you guys think I would ever be where I am today? Probably not. <laughs> um, there's definitely a strong connection between my personal life and my business life. I have never disconnected the two. My job never ends at 5 p.m. I wake up in the middle of the night thinking how I can make my business better. I incorporate my daughter into my business life as well. Okay? So I don't feel that that ever has to be separated. It can be. Some people struggle with that. But I feel that that was the secret to my success, is that I always felt that I had to be secure in my business life to move forward in my personal life. Okay? PMA. No, not PMS. PMA, positive mental attitude. Whoa, that's a big one. Uh, before social media, when I was running my business, when anyone would ask me about my business, even when I was struggling, I always told them it was going amazing. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. Everything's going great. I'm so busy, even though I hadn't gotten a call in two weeks. Okay? I still kept a good attitude about it. Um, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of warning with social media. You are what you post. If you are constantly posting negative things on Facebook, on, well, Instagram is really loud for that, but any, any outlet that everybody can see, it's not private. That goes out to the universe. I have people that have worked for me that when I see some of the junk they post on Facebook, I'm like, and you wonder why negative things come to you all the time, right? And they don't last long with me because I like working with people that have 
you know, strong attitudes and want to be able to succeed and be successful, definitely having a positive mental attitude about anything and everything that you do is gonna make you more successful in life. So before you post something on Facebook, think about it, right? Write in a journal. Everyone go out and get a journal, write in there if you're a little angry, okay? <laughs> Don't put it on Facebook. Um, so definitely check yourself before you vent, okay? Um, a strong sense of responsibility. I've always felt a strong sense of not just responsibility, but empathy towards the animals and the people that work with me. Um, I did this for a long time by myself, but now that I have um, a lot of staff that works for me, I definitely feel very responsible for them because now I help them to live a normal life. They get a regular paycheck. I'm responsible for that. Okay, thank you, sweetie. I'm almost done. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> Good timing. Um, so the song, Strong Sense of Responsibility, um, that's the stuff that keeps me up at night, right? That's the stuff that keeps me thinking. That's the stuff that keeps me thriving, um, is just feeling that strong sense of responsibility. And of course, that probably goes hand in hand with the passion, okay? Um, focus. Staying on my path. Um, I got lost for many years doing the part of businesses I wasn't good at like managing, I was a horrible manager. So now I pay other people and I trust other people to take care of those parts of my business so that I can really focus on the things that I like to do, which is traveling to work, um, having students, teaching workshops, um, and then obviously I can spend time being a stay-at-home mom as well. So um, it works great, I love that opportunity. Um, and as a serial entrepreneur, I'm constantly conducting experiments and for me, <laughs> the fun will always continue, okay? So I hope this might be the beginning of your adventures towards success. Thank you very much, you guys. <laughs> the number one mistake I see people handling dogs and dealing with them um, is not seeking out professional help um, training. So I definitely, if, you're, if you have a dog, just get help. You know, I see people really struggling with those types of things. So it's, you know, this is why I'm in business. Um, but some of the simple things, if you guys ever are looking at getting a dog or a puppy, crate training. Even an adult dog, if you're adopting an adult dog, crate training. 80% of dogs in shelters and rescues probably wouldn't be there if people would have crate trained. Um, which means just keeping them somewhere safe and secure when you're not available. Don't jump, you have so much to live for. <laughs> but thank you, great question. How I got my capital for my first business, actually what I did is I was paying back the original owner, right? So that was part of, you know, kind of being in the hole. More often than not, was not only was I paying rent, but I was also buying the business from him in increments every month. So, yeah, but thank you, great question. <laughs> is leading people different than leading dogs? No, <laughs> not really. And I'm also training my daughter just like a puppy, so it's great. She's, you know, she's totally crate trained. She's not housebroken yet, but she's working on it. <laughs> uh, how old was I when I started my first business? I was 19. Yeah, 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 I was, I was young. I didn't know what I was doing. It was crazy, but it seemed like such a good opportunity. Yes, yeah, I was in college at the time. And actually, um, I moved out here. Um, from Wisconsin, uh, I moved out here to go to college and I actually dropped out. Um, I started at the University of Utah and for me, I'm a big skier and snowboarder. Um, and so it was like two classes, two feet, <laughs> you know, it, was, uh, it wasn't really much of a question for me. So I ended up dropping out um, at the time. And then I went back to Westminster um, with the intention actually to go to vet school. Um, but during that time, I realized that vet school wasn't the right path for me. So, yeah.